Welcome, everybody. How y'all doing this morning? All right, well, this is Grace Community Church, and my name is Jason. And the first song we're going to do, we're going to kick it right off. We're going to ask you to stand, if you will. And the song is called In Jesus' Name. We're talking about the faithfulness of God on this morning. Woo! I'm going to ask you to clap your hands with us. about God's faithfulness and it comes from Lamentations 3 23 that says 
God is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. So as you sing this song with us together, I pray that you can just concentrate on the words of this hymn.
this is my story. Y'all sing it with us. Say, this is my Thank you for this time that we're here. We thank you for us being consecrated in this place, Lord God, to worship you, to give you the glory that's due your name. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. You may be seated. Amen. Morning, everybody. Morning. Great to see you. Week two of uh, Reason to Believe. Derek did a great job kicking us off uh, last week. And today we are going to talk about a question that I think is actually at the root of almost all the questions that we have about the Bible. And you all sent a lot of questions last week. Thank you so much for doing that, sending questions. I, we had dozens and dozens of questions uh, from last week, and there's a way to QR code. We won't show it today, but we'll show it again probably next week, where you can uh, keep asking questions. You know, to me, it seems as if, reading the Bible, that spiritual seeking is, is, is tied, you know, like spiritual growth is tied to spiritual seeking and spiritual seeking is tied to questions, which is why Jesus asked more than 300 questions in the Gospels. So when we stop asking questions, it's like we cease to grow. So these questions are really important. And today we're dealing with a question that's probably at the root of so many questions. Well, I want to start with this. Uh, I recently took my wife, Krista, uh, to Ireland. 
Uh, I had told her many years ago, because she's Irish, that, you know, I, I actually gave it as a birthday gift. I would take her to Ireland, and it's been many years since I made good on that gift. So we finally went about a month ago. We had a fantastic time, really. What a great place, and just so beautiful. I uh, have so many stories from that trip, but I just want to tell you about one. I love the way they talk, right? If you ever talk to an Irish person, love the way they talk, and, you know, the accent, and then the choice of words. Uh, they're very religious in their conversation, too. Maybe you've noticed that. Very, very religious in their conversation. We were going, we're at like on top of a cliff, and there was a path down to this beautiful beach, and we're getting ready to start down. There's a great big old Irish guy, and he was, he was coming up, and I just said, hey, is it worth the trip? And he said, oh, Jesus. So very religious in a conversation. But I, one of the things I like is like they keep the words at the back of their mouth. The, the words are like back here. It's like that's part of the accent. I kept trying to tell Chris that it's like the words are somehow back there. Sweet Mary and Joseph, like they're back here. And when we had a conversation, Chris and I had a conversation with a guy for about 10 minutes. It was a fantastic conversation. Again, the choice of words and the accent is awesome. We got done, we walked away, and I said, did you understand anything that he just said? She said, absolutely not. It was a great conversation. I have no idea what he said. And I got to thinking, look, if we can't understand what somebody is saying today in English, how in the world are we gonna understand what somebody is writing in Hebrew 3,000 years ago? Everybody, our question today is, is how can you take the Bible literally? And where is it literal and where is it a metaphor and how do you decide and is it all subjective? Like, what are we doing here? Okay, so this is what we're gonna focus on uh, today. And I wanna say this. I talked about questions a moment ago and how important questions are to the Bible and spiritual growth for sure is tied to asking questions. Like, if you made a decision, I'm not gonna ask questions anymore, you've made the decision, I don't really wanna grow anymore, right? That's what it's really all about. So after this service, right after this service, right here, uh, we're gonna do a Q&R, it's question and response. I don't have all the answers, so we do a question and response. We'll do it after this service, we'll do it after the next service, okay? Who has heard of the famous Scopes Monkey Trial? Scopes Monkey Trial, okay? All right, only a few of us. So let me, let me tell you a little bit, because it's a very important time in the life of America and the way we view the Bible as Americans. It's really important. Dayton, Tennessee, 1925. Now everybody, up, up until the 1850s, all of our Ivy League, all of our most prestigious institutions, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, they were, they were all completely religious. They were run by pastors or theologians. All their mottos were totally biblical. Okay? And then in 1859, Charles, Charles Darwin released his book, Origin of Species. And when that came out and people read it, they're like, oh, wait a minute. Here we are at the most intellectual institutions in the United States of America, and we feel like there's some kind of break. And so from that point on, intellectuals began asking themselves, can I be an intellectual at Harvard as the president of Harvard and still believe in the Bible? The Scopes Monkey Trial is the culmination of that. It took 50, 60 years to get there, but it's the culmination. John Thomas Scopes was a substitute science teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, and he started teaching evolution. And they said, you better stop. He wouldn't stop, so they took him to court. Now, the, the attorneys in the case, famous. Clarence Darrow was the defense attorney. But more famous than Darrow was William Jennings Bryan. He was the lead prosecutor, everybody. He's a lead prosecutor. He had run for president three times, and he's a former secretary of state and a devout Christian. Now, here's the craziest thing. He decided to put himself on the stand. He's the lead prosecutor in the case. Maybe a little arrogant. He decides to put himself on the stand to defend the Bible. What was the first question that was asked? What is Darrow in his first question to William, William Jennings Bryan on the stand? What is his... The question is the same question we're answering today. He says to Brian, he says, is the Bible literal? What's his second question they ask him? Do you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish? Okay, so we're gonna bring both of those together today if we can. Do you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish? Now I wanna show you some things that I think are really important. And again, um, I think the root of this question is, is probably at the root of almost, almost all of our questions about the Bible. Uh, for sure, a lot of the questions that we received that you guys sent in last week. But I wanna show you something here that's very important about the Bible. The Bible is made up of these things. 
and there's not a lot of debate about it. Right? So how many, nobody in the first service, one person said they read poetry. Does anybody in this room read poetry? Oh my gosh, okay, all right, you guys, you're romantics in this room. We had no romantics in the first service, so poetry. Um, okay, uh, I don't read poetry. Here's, here's the deal, because I'm not just a huge fan. Uh, a third of the Bible is poetry. So I might say, I don't love poetry, I don't read poetry, I read the Bible all the time. A third of the Bible is poetry, so actually I read poetry all the time, okay? Paradox, why would you have a paradox in literature? Because we use paradox in literature because it's not at the surface level. You wanna to go to something that's extremely deep. The Bible says and declares that itself that is extremely deep. Like you can never reach the depths of the complexities of the Bible, and so that's why we use paradox. That's what they used back then and you have to recognize it. And until we embrace what the Bible is, we're never gonna get the meaning, which is really what it's all about. All right, metaphor. I mentioned poetry a minute ago, one of the most famous poems in American history, Robert Frost, The Road Less Travel, where he basically says, I was in a wood, I saw two paths, I took one path and it changed my life forever. Hey, everybody, I'm like, where is that path? <laughs> I wanna change my life forever. Should we put out a search for the path? and let everybody know where it is so everybody can have a great life. Somehow we figured out it was a metaphor. Somehow we're not in searching for it. Okay, a chiasm. I am, like, I didn't even know what a chiasm was till I started studying the Bible. Bible's filled with chiasms. The center of the chiasm is the point of the entire text of Scripture, and they're all over the place in Scripture. Some of us get very, the binding of Isaac. How could Abraham bind his own son and get ready to sacrifice him? It's a chiasm. Okay, intertextuality, we'll do a lot of that next week, a lot of it. I just wanna, I hear this all the time and I hear all kinds of stuff, all kinds of answers given to this question because next week is about violence. I just, I can't encourage you enough. Please, if you could bring your friends who are frustrated or curious about the Bible. Like Kimball in this book, this is Derek's book. This is like, hey, he put this up last week. He's like, hey, you gotta get this book. This is what this, this guy's a professor, he's a pastor, he teaches, I think, at a Bible college or something like that. He said, here's the one question that would make me think about running away from God and no longer being a pastor. Why in 1 Samuel 15 is the call for the slaughtering of women and children? Everybody, I just wanna say, there might be a fantastic answer if you embrace the Bible for what it is that is very inspiring. So there's a lot of people who are running with the Bible and say God's a monster and all this kind of stuff. It's just because we're not taking the Bible as it's meant to be taken. So please, please consider inviting people. A lot of intertextuality in that. And then repeating words, which we're going to do uh, this morning. Now, I would like to ask for some of your participation, a little bit of your help. Can you think of things in the Bible? Like, is that literal? Like the talking snake in Genesis chapter 3. Is that literal? Can you all think of other things in the Bible that not you, but your friends would say, is that literal? Any, any, any ideas that you could just, please? Talking donkey. Talking donkey. Okay. Some people say that happens every Sunday at church. Okay. <laughs> what else? Rising from the dead. What's that? Rising from, the dead. Rising from the dead. Thank you very much. Walking on water. Walking on water. Thank you. Parting the Red Sea. Parting the Red sea. All of these are fantastic. Okay, um, how do we distinguish when the Bible is being literal and when it's using a metaphor? Here's, here, here's what God calls himself in the Bible. God says that he is a rock. He's the rock of our salvation. I wonder what kind of rock God is. What kind of rock is God? We're told that God's a spirit. We're told that God's water. We're told that God is a vine. We're told that God is light. Is he incandescent or is he one of these new LEDs? How do we figure that out? God is a good shepherd and that we are his sheep. Oh, what kind of sheep you are? Are you a nice fluffy sheep? What kind of sheep? Are you the black sheep? I don't know. Well, I mean, how did you figure this out? Okay, Jesus, what did Jesus say? Jesus says, and we're gonna have communion today, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, is that literal? Do we have to find Jesus and, and get all? I mean, what is that? Jesus famously says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look, look at a woman lustfully, you should gouge out your eyes. How did we say, oh, well, that's definitely a metaphor. Like, who told us? It doesn't say, it doesn't like, it didn't say, you don't have like this parenthesis and Jesus says, well, that's a metaphor. I just want you all to know that's a metaphor. No, no, it doesn't say that. But somehow we like figured it out because a lot of people who love the Bible, <laughs> a lot of guys who love the Bible, they're walking around, they got two eyes. I just want to know why, how, how do, on what basis did we figure that out? You're the salt of the earth. Don't pray in public. Jesus says in Sermon on the Mount, don't pray in public. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't pray. We just prayed in public. Did we break 
did we break the Bible? I just, okay, right? And Kimball's book here, all right? Again, if, get the book, and if you have any problems with the book, please talk to Derek. It's his book, Derek.80, trygrace.org, all right? This is what he says. He, said, he quotes somebody off the internet. It says, reading the Bible is the fast track to atheism. Why was that? Why is the fast track to Okay, anybody here believe in unicorns? Unicorns, unicorn, unicorn, right there. We had one person in the first, oh, somebody else over the unicorn, okay. Uh, nine times in the Bible, it talks about unicorns, okay? Uh, the Bible bans shaving. Did anybody shave this morning? You broke the command. No cursing, no cursing. Anybody curse this morning, don't raise your hand. Gossip, <laughs> eating shrimp and pork. The Bible says that you should not wear clothing that has mixed materials like cotton and polyester. Do you need to check the tag on your clothing right now? Okay? Don't take it off if it's wrong. Right? Now, the Scopes Monkey Trial, again, is the culmination of this question. On what basis are we trying to figure out if the Bible is literal? And like I said, th th it was this culmination of intellectuals at our most famous institution saying, can I be an intellectual and still believe in the Bible? Can I do it? Well, I want to give you a quote from a famous intellectual on his thoughts about the Bible. He says, the Bible is the foundation of all literature and art. Wow. That's a pretty bold statement. The Bible is the foundation of all literature and art. If you go through the galleries of the world, you will see that all the greatest art is inspired by the Bible. That's by a famous intellectual named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who based his entire civil rights movement on the Bible. Okay? We have to accept the Bible for what it is, and when we accept it for what it is, I think what we'll find is there's zero conflict between the Bible and science. Zero conflict. But we're going to have to accept it for what it is. Now, I want to tell you uh, two things uh, that's important. That the community actually that wrote the Bible, the Jewish community that wrote the Bible uh, so many years ago, that they understood about the Bible. They understood the language. Of course they understood the language. They understood the culture. They understood the genre. They understood all these things. They also understood these two things, shot and drash. Shot, the plain meaning of the text. The Bible doesn't often do this, but when it does, it's powerful. You can read the text and it's plain, it's clear. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Those are verses that have changed the world. Nobody was thinking it. Nobody was writing it. What does it say? Every single person is created in the image of God. Aristotle said, absolutely not. There are some people who are better and there are some people worse. Today, as Washingtonians, I would think almost all of us in this great city, right, of Washington, D.C., we say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Everybody's created equal in the image of God. If you believe that today, you got your idea for that from the, sh from the shot of Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Those words written have changed the world, changed the world, because now we say people are created equal and that just wasn't being done, not at all. But there's a lot of drash in the Bible. What's drash? It's deeper, it's more, you know, that's what the Bible declares itself to be, deep, complex. It's the deeper complex meaning of the text. Jonah, remember? Daryl asked William Jennings Bryant at the Scopes Monkey Trial, was Jonah swallowed by a fish? Okay? There is a tremendous amount of drash in Jonah. And what is important is that we figure out what does this book of Jonah mean? Right? What does it mean to me and not get caught up with the fish? So what is the meaning of Jonah? Now, Jesus is really into meaning. Everybody, that's what the Bible is supposed to be for. Like, I'm not really sure... Uh, about like we get caught up on the fish and Jonah's like how does it change your life the nature of biblical literature is it's supposed to transform your life that's what it said it's supposed to do like daily practical it's like I do I have to search for how this is going to change my life no it should just it should be so obvious that it changes your life I'm not sure that if I think oh Jonah swallowed by a fish oh my gosh that changes my life my life is so much better. Every day I'm just going to get up and just be so excited about launching into the world. I'm just, I'm just going to act like Jesus because Jonah got swallowed by a fish. So Jesus says some very important words, again in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He says these days, you have heard it said, but I'm going to tell you this. What is that about? You have heard this said, but I'm going to tell you this. He's not changing what the Bible says. He's saying to the religious leaders, you read the words, but you missed the meaning. So he says to them, you've heard it said that you shouldn't murder. And they're like, yeah, we ain't murdered anybody, and we feel really good about it, okay? Ten Commandments. Jesus says, yeah, you saw the words, you missed the meaning. 
Because what's the meaning? Jesus says the deeper meaning, the drash of the Ten Commandments is, is that if you get angry with somebody and you, you, you speak dehumanizing words to them, that is what the deeper meaning of the text is because that actually leads to murder. So you got to go back to the root. There's the drash. Okay, what do we know about genocide? Every single genocide that has ever happened on this planet began because somebody began speaking dehumanizing words to somebody else. There's the drash of it. If we get caught up on the surface level, don't murder, you, you're not transforming your life. You want to transform your life, you want to transform the world, then get into the drash of what Jesus is saying, okay? If you want to destroy a friendship, you want to destroy your place of work, you want to destroy your marriage, what does the great scientist, John Gottman, who studies marriage say? Start speaking critical, dehumanizing words to your friend, your boss, your, your coworker, your spouse, right? Just start doing that. You will destroy it. He calls it the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You start speaking that, you've ended it. Wow! Jesus is like spot on scientifically true. Are you getting my connections? This is why the drash is so important. And there's so much drash that we find in Jonah. It profoundly impacts the life. Okay, now I'm going to read you Jonah. I'm going to start out in chapter 1, read the first three verses. But I want to tell you this before I do. The meaning in Jonah. So this is what Jesus would say about Jonah. If you just see the words and you miss their meaning, you're missing out on so much. And here's what I mean. The meaning of Jonah has profoundly impacted your life and my life every single day in a positive way or a negative way. Because what the meaning of Jonah is about, it's about what we need parents to be like. It's about balancing kind of rules and consequences on one side, everybody and mercy and grace on the other side. Now, you can call this tough love or you can call it servant leadership. Here's what we know about leaders. Here's what we know. The best of all leaders know how to balance these two. If you grew up in a home where it was just like all rules, all rules, all rules and no grace, you had a far less than good childhood. This is what we know about you. If you lived in a home where there was no consequences, it was all just do whatever the heck you want, man. It's just all free. You had, a, you had a childhood that was far, far less than what it should have been. If you grew up in a home or you have a boss or you had a coach or a teacher, anything, here's what we know. Somebody who struggles between the balance of this, you had a immeasurably better life. If you'll be that kind of parent, if you'll be that kind of boss, if you'll be that kind of person, your life will spread goodness around this world. This is what we absolutely, there's no question about this. So what Jonah is saying in this great book about Jonah is the very foundations of our life. Do you want to have a better life? Do you want the people around you to have a better life? Here's what the meaning of Jonah is. Okay, so let's go for it. Jonah 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because of its wickedness. Now, I inserted the Hebrew word ra. It's ra. It's just a two-letter word, ra. It means evil. And so I'm just going to keep using it because it's a repeating word, right? And they were evil. They were as evil as you can imagine. They perpetrated tremendous harm on the Israelites, okay? Go to that great city and preach against it because it's evil has come before me. But Jonah, <laughs> he runs from the Lord and he heads for Tarshish. That's the opposite direction. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Everybody, the uh, original community, the Jewish people that wrote this, they call this a satire. Why would they call it a satire? They call it a satire because in this book, everybody is turning to God except for the man of God. Like, it's amazing. And Jonah is the most successful prophet of all the prophets of the Bible. So he boards the ship, right? And everybody's up on deck and they're rowing for their lives because a big, huge storm hits them. And Jonah's down below sleeping. They're praying, he's sleeping. The man of God is sleeping below deck while they're up praying. And then afterwards, they find out. They cast lots and they found out, oh, Jonah, this is your fault. The storm is your fault. We're all getting ready to die and it's all your fault. And he's like, hey, throw me into the sea. Like, no, no, we're not going to do it. So they keep rowing for the life. They show mercy where he doesn't want to show any mercy. The man of God doesn't want to show any mercy. And the pagan sailors want to show mercy. Okay. Eventually, they're like, God, forgive us. And they repent and they pray. Who do they pray to? They pray to the God of the Bible. They pray specifically to Yahweh. And they sacrifice and they repent and they say, please forgive us. And they pick him up and they throw him into the sea. And then here's where we're like, ah, oh, is this true? Is this true? Here's the question at the Scopes Monkey Trial. 
he was swallowed by a fish. Now, everybody, you'd have to read this in Hebrew, but actually, two fish. You won't see it in your English translations. There's two fish down there. That's a whole nother sermon. We're not going to go there. Two fish down there. Isn't that fascinating? And he gets in the belly of the fish. He's there for three days. And he prays, but he never repents. Everybody's repenting. Like the whole book is about repentance. Like this book is read on Yom Kippur, the day of repentance. But Jonah never repents. And then God says, okay, so he prays. God says to the fish, spit, spit him out. And then God speaks to him. He's on the beach. You can imagine what he looked like. I want you to go to this great city of Nineveh and preach to it. Now he walks into the city. It says it takes, the city's so big, it takes him three days to walk around it. He barely says anything. You know why? Because he doesn't want them to get off. He wants them to experience the consequences. So he barely preaches anything. And the entire city repents. The whole city. The whole city repents. The king does. All the people. They repent. They fast. They pray and they beg for God's mercy. And he is ticked off because he didn't want to see that. Everybody, the, he was so successful. He's the most successful prophet of the entire Bible who did not want to do what he was doing. He did not want to give this message to them because he didn't want them to get off the hook. We're told that even the animal, the, the, the king says even the animals have to participate. They are fasting too. It's like they're getting spiritual too. Now, Krista says that her dog every morning reads the Bible with her and prays. And I thought, that's crazy. That's crazy. I've never, that's crazy. That's crazy, right? But maybe she's on to something here, okay? Because Jonah says they're all repenting. All right, they're all sacrificing, blah, blah, blah. Now, okay, now, after he does this and everybody repents, he goes to the outside of the city and he sits on a hilltop and just watches. And he's hoping that God is gonna nail them. But let's see what happens. Jonah chapter four, this is fascinating. All right, we're gonna read about a plant and the plant is the key. The fact that he's Jonah, son of Amittai, which means son of truth, and the plan to the end bookends to this whole story. Plants the key. All right. But Jonah, but to Jonah, this seemed very evil. And he became evil. And he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending evil. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right? for you to be so angry. I want to stop right here. Okay. Uh, you see this thing where he quotes, uh, you're God, you're gracious, you're compassionate. All right. He is quoting Exodus 34, the most repeated verse in the entire Bible. God said, hey, this is what we should repeat the most. And God describes himself as a compassionate God and a God of truth. Both. God, truth. The same thing that Jonah is about. Except for this fact. He changes that last word, the end of verse number two. I knew you would relent from sending evil because he wants the city destroyed. The actual verse says, you, you, you are a God of truth. And Jonah says, no, you're not a God of truth because if you're God of truth, you would have made them pay. They would have to experience the consequences of what they went through. Jonah is the son of truth. And he say, in a world that doesn't have truth, I would rather die. I would rather die than live in a world that doesn't have truth. Why is that? Because a world that doesn't have truth is a world that doesn't have meaning. Everybody, you and I, our brains have been wired. That beautiful brain inside your mind has been wired by God for reciprocity. Reciprocity. Cause and effect. Okay? You walk into a car dealership. You go into the showroom. You think about buying a $50,000 car. Okay? What does a salesperson come and do? They hand you a pen or a bottle of water. Why do they do that? Because they know something about your brain. Your brain wants things to be equal. And if somebody has done something for me, my brain says I must do something for them. Cause and effect. So the next time you go to buy a car, don't take the pen. Okay, don't take the pen. It's your brain craves it. Your brain craves it. There's nothing wrong. These people were evil. They should experience a consequence. And Jonah's saying, hey God, if you're not gonna give them the consequences of what they've done, then you're not a God of truth and the whole, whole world is meaningless. I just want you to imagine, okay, everybody? You go to heaven. Many of us who read the Bible is like, okay, one day I'm gonna go to heaven and, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to have all of my good deeds and my bad deeds reviewed by God. God's gonna review them all. So let's say you're in the waiting room of heaven. You're waiting for the big review and an angel walks in and says, you know what God's decided? No review for you. Just come on in. And at first thought, you're like, oh, this is awesome. And your next thought is, oh, this is terrible. You mean everything I did didn't really mean anything? It didn't mean anything? Chris and I know uh, a young guy when he was in his 20s, many, many years ago, uh, he drank a lot. And one day he drank so much, he's completely drunk. 
went out, got in his car at night, blew through a red light and killed somebody. The person he killed was a young husband and father. They had two kids. They go to court. Now, the family of the guy that got killed, what are they praying for? Justice, Justice which is what? Jail. Consequences. Consequences. Okay. The person that was drunk was driving the car. That family was very, very religious. Very religious. What are all of them praying for? Bingo. Now, what would happen? How would you, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the family that lost horrifically, terribly, unnecessarily. They lost a husband, a father, and a son, okay? I want you to imagine first day of the trial that the judge comes over to this family and says, hey, can we go back to the chambers again? I want to talk to you a minute. You go back to the chambers, the judge says, hey, look, I talked to the guy that got drunk, the young guy. Look, he's got his whole life ahead of him. He's really sorry. Can we just drop all these charges and just go? Is that okay? No, it's not okay. No, it's not okay. Forgiveness is different than you escaping consequences. All of us, look, there needs to be consequences. There needs to be consequences. A world without consequences renders your life meaningless and you don't want to live in that world. And that's why Jonah says, I would rather die, the son of truth, because he's all truth, than live in a world that doesn't have any meaning. But living in a world that doesn't have any compassion is also a world that doesn't have any meaning. So where are you? You got to be right here. Let's, let's, let's read what it says. Okay? Picking up verse number five. Jonah had gone out, sat down at a place east of the city. East of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sits in its shade and waited to see what's going to happen to the city. Then the Lord God, all right, very interesting here. This is God's name, both names of God. One means truth. One means compassion. Right here in the center. Compassion, truth. Provides a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah, give shade for his head and to deliver him from his evil. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at the dawn the next day, truth provides a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, truth provides a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head that he grew faint. He wanted to die and he said, I would rather die than to live, okay? But truth said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he says, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. <laughs> Everybody, a world without truth and consequences is a meaningless world. And a world without compassion, mercy, and grace is a meaningless world. The plant is the key. The plant is the key. The plant doesn't deserve to be there. Okay, there was no seed. That's not the way the world works. There's no seed. The plant just sprung up overnight. You don't have trees grow up overnight in your front yard. That is, that's not the way it works. There's a seed, you tend, you water, and that's what the remaining verses of Jonah said. So the worm, the worm is pure truth. And the worm comes along and looks at this thing that should not be there, should not be there, and says, you got to go. The plant is pure compassion. It did deserve no seed, no tending, no watering. And so the worm comes along, truth says, you got to go. Here is the balance. If you're all truth like Jonah was when he started out, it's going to be oppressive. And when you see mercy and grace given, you're going to say, I want to die. I can't stand this. But if you're in a world where there's nothing but mercy and grace, you're also going to say, this world is meaningless. This world is meaningless. And I want to die. It's a delicate balance. Everybody, again, you can call it tough love. You can call it servant leadership. Your entire life, your entire life to this day, if your life has been good or bad, somewhere measured in between, it is because your parents, your teachers, your coaches, people in power positions in your life, they either struggled with the delicate balance or didn't. Will you struggle with the delicate balance? This is why Jesus Christ is the meaning of all things. This is why, because Jesus brings these two together. So John tells us at the beginning of John chapter 1, John 14, he says, we have seen his glory, speaking of Jesus, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of what? Grace and truth. The great repeating verse, again, Exodus 34 is the most repeated verse in the Bible. It's about that God is a God of mercy and grace and compassion and that God is a God of truth and consequences. 
can you bring the two together? Meaning is found in Jesus Christ because Jesus perfectly brings the two together. And if you will be that kind of person, the people around you will be very, very thankful for it. And their lives will be better because you have reflected Jesus Christ. Now, as it turns out, everybody, we don't do very good around yes people. Have you ever heard that before? You ever heard a leader who had a tremendous downfall and they said, yeah, he was nothing but surrounded by yes people. Has anybody ever heard that before? We're not good around yes people. It turns out that yes people, yes people is like do whatever you want, no consequence, do whatever you want, no consequences, that's destruction. But it also turns out to be true if we're around nothing but no people. Oh man, isn't that irritating? Isn't it irritating to be around? No, 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 I want no, no. That's really irritating. As it turns out, our brains are wired for this and our life flourishes if we're around yes and no people. Yes and no people. Now look what Jesus Christ does in John chapter eight. So there's this woman, she's caught in the act of adultery. Where's the guy? Don't know. Obviously, this is a terrible situation. It's just really, really bad, okay? We don't know. But all the religious leaders are there because the rule, sa the rule says that there needs to be a consequence and the consequence is that she gets stoned. Are, we, are you with me? Now, she's done something bad. She's broken the heart of a wife somewhere. Nobody wants their spouse to have an affair on them. Nobody wants their boyfriend or girlfriend to cheat on them. That breaks people's hearts. People cry a lot when that happens. Okay, so let's get, let's get real for a second. This is a serious thing she's done. And Jesus says this in John chapter 8. He says to her, hey, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. Then, then Jesus says this, neither do I condemn you. I'm giving you mercy and grace. But then he follows up with this. You ready for this? Go now and leave your life of sin. Do you see it? Do you see it now? Will you be that kind of person? Now, I want to turn this really personal for just a moment. Really personal. Because we're going to have communion. And if you don't have one of these and you, everybody's free and welcome to celebrate communion, um, you see there's a little wafer on the bottom and then the juice, okay? So we're gonna take communion. I, I just want this, the meaning of Jonah, to get very personal to you. Because if you walk out today, it's like, yeah, we talked about a fish today, then you, you, you've missed it. What we've talked about is the thing that's gonna make your life exponentially better and the lives of people around you, and we know this from history and science, it's gonna make the lives of other people exponentially better or but now I want to turn it towards us during communion because communion is a great time to reflect, okay? If you look in the mirror today during this time of reflection, are you letting yourself get off the hook? Are, are you ba breaking boundaries and barriers, ignoring consequences, giving yourself a free pass, and it really is having a negative impact on your life and you need to stop that? Like, do you need to respect that? How about this? Is it negatively impacting the people around you? Could be the words you say, could be the habits you have. I don't know. I don't know. But it seems like to me, my entire life is going back and forth between these two things. My whole life, every day, all day long, going back and forth. So what, what is it for you? Are you having a time in your life where you need to say, you know what? I need to do something about this in my life and today is a great day for it. I asked our, our prayer team to be over here during communion. Look. The answer starts with prayer, but it will never end with prayer because there's stuff for us to do. God isn't like going to drop out of the sky and make your life right. He's going to say, I need you to participate with me. Can you confront yourself in the mirror today during communion just like I need to confront myself and say, what am I doing? I'm ignoring consequences. I'm breaking barriers. I need to stop that for myself and for others. Okay? Or maybe you need to confront somebody in your life because you've been letting them get away with it. And it's time for it to stop. You've been a yes person, and that's time to stop. Let's go to the flip side. Mercy, grace, and compassion. Hey, everybody. Here's the reality, what we know about many of us in this room. The internal monologue inside of our brains is ungodly. The stuff we say about ourselves to ourselves inside of our minds, Jesus would say, please, stop saying that. Give yourself some mercy and grace and compassion. You're out of balance. Please, there's a great verse in the Bible that says, take every thought captive, to conform it to the thoughts of Jesus. Do you need to do that? I bet a bunch of us do. Because we know that we allow those 
ungodly monologues to go. So as we have communion this morning, where are you? One side or the other, we tend to always be out of balance. And if we'll come in balance, we'll find that this tremendous book, The Meaning of Jonah, will revolution our lives every single day as we wrestle with the delicate balance between truth and consequences and mercy and grace. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord. Your word is so, so practical and powerful in my daily life. Bless the eating of this bread and the drinking of this cup. And may all of us confront whatever we need to confront today with your help. In Christ's name, amen. Let us eat and drink together. Thank you, John. If there's anything um, just heavy in your heart or in your minds, we would love to pray for you or with you. Our prayer team is going to be under the screen right here. And I really wanted to encourage you to take advantage of this. Um, it, there, we build a sense of community when we pray for each other, with each other, and we share what's in our heart. Our prayer team is a safe space. Whatever is shared with them stays right there. Uh, whether those are questions or thoughts or whatever it is that is pressing your heart, we would love to pray for you. If you're new to Grace, if this is your first time and you haven't met me yet, my name is Anna and I would love to meet you and say hi, talk a little bit about our church uh, and just get to know you. And usually I'm under this screen, but you can see it's a little bit crowded in there. So I'm going to be back there where Mary is waving. Uh, so please just come say hi to me. I would love to meet you. But other than that, oh, we have a Q&R this um, coming off right after this service. So if you have any questions, pressing questions about the message, about Jonah, the one fish, two fish, was it a fish, was it a whale? Stick around, ask the questions. Pastor John doesn't have all the answers, but he has a lot to say. So stay right here and we'll get you uh, with the Q&R session. Other than that, we hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Enjoy your week. God bless you all.